Well, good evening and welcome to this Wednesday evening talk. I'm in the kitchen in front of a fridge, uh, as will become apparent in a moment uh, why that is. But let me just read from Genesis 8 verses, uh, just one verse actually, verse 22 from the New Living Translation. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Words that God said to Noah. Um, but, uh, but I'll come on to that in a moment. You know, as you think back over some of the things that we've thought about, we've thought about creation and we've thought about the fall and then we've thought about the kind of the Sabbath in between. Uh, and we've thought about, you know, the first, those are the first three chapters of Genesis. And what I thought over the next uh, kind of coming Wednesdays is we'd think about you know, a bit more in Genesis. We'd look at kind of bite-sized chunks uh, of God's word uh, and we just briefly have a look at some of the things that take place. So today is Genesis 4 to 9. I'm not going to read it all. Uh, so if you want to have a read of that in your own time then that would be great. Uh, but it takes us from when the fall uh, happens and then the consequences of the fall to, uh, to Noah. Uh, and those words we've just heard were, as I say, to Noah. So Chapter 4 uh, of Genesis, we, oh hold on, before I start, there's something in here that maybe I should show you, because uh, we're going to think about temptation uh, in a little bit. Oh, look at that. God, looks good, doesn't it? Better shut the door. Right, so, Genesis 4, you know, when the fall happens in Genesis 3, a kind of you kind of think that Genesis 4 is going to be a bit better. Uh, you know, it's devastating what happens in, in chapter 3 uh, as Adam and Eve get sent out of the garden and, you know, because of sin, they fall into sin uh, and we get disease and sickness and toil, hard work and death, uh, all because the devil uh, deceived them. And so, and so we move into chapter 4, and what happens? Adam and Eve, their two sons, and one of them murders the other one. It's shocking. You know, the consequences of sin, the effect is huge. And then as you go through 4 and 5, you, you know, it, it doesn't get any better. There's these kind of strange relationships that take place. I'm not fully sure exactly what they are. Uh, and it, it's just a real mess. And we get these words of, uh, uh, in there that God is looking at the world and he sees how great the wickedness of humanity had become, that every inclination of their hearts was evil. And it says that God was grieved that he had created humanity. Verse 6, it said his heart was filled with pain. His heart was filled with pain. You know, what was so beautiful in Genesis 1 and 2, by the time you've got through to Genesis 6, was just such a mess. Such a mess. Yet, in chapter 6, verse 8, we get the word, but. And it says this, But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. And that verse is so important because, you know, God relented from his thought of destroying creation and he went with Noah. And that one man would be the way through which there would be like a recreation as God would wash away the old creation and start again through Noah and his family, uh, in, through the ark uh, and everything else. And you know, as you think about that, it sounds a little bit like Jesus, doesn't it? That through Jesus, uh, the God-man, uh, God would save the world. Uh, but obviously that comes a lot later on. And so, you know, Noah builds this ark, his family are saved, uh, and he has all the animals come to him that God sends to him, and he goes on to the ark, uh, and then the rain starts, the people were, you know, laughing and everything else around, but the rain starts, the boat sails, 
and the, you know they're on that boat a long time and then the water starts to recede after the flood uh, all that 40 days and nights of rain but then uh, then it settles down and then there's a beautiful picture of the sacrifice uh, and offerings uh, and God making a covenant that you would never again flood the earth that that verse that i read at the beginning that you'll always have you know the harvest uh, and uh, different seasons uh, and you know that picture of the world will carry on and obviously we're part of that continuing uh, all these years later so that's the kind of story of four to uh, to nine. Uh, obviously, the rainbow is part of that because the covenant symbol was the rainbow, and every time you see a rainbow, it reminds us that God's promised never to flood the whole world again. But I thought I'd focus in on one thing, and that one thing is Cain and Abel and temptation. You know, it's really interesting. The, what God said to uh, to Cain. Let, but before I do that, I'm going to read that in a moment. Let me read James 1 to you, because the Bible says that it's not God who tempts us. Uh, and James 1, 13 to 15 says this, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So I have in here, as you've seen, a chocolate cake. If you think about Cain in Genesis 4, what did God say to him before he killed his brother? He says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So sin is crouching at your door. So God was warning him, you know, telling him, you don't have to do this. There is another way. And actually, as he walks, as Cain walks out with his brother into the fields, I'm sure those words must have been there. But he didn't follow what God had said. He continued into uh, that temptation and he committed the most awful sin in murdering his brother. Inside here, you know, this is very different in a sense because it's just a chocolate cake. But it's an illustration because temptation is there for all of us um, each day of our lives as things that can tempt us to to go away from God or to do something against what God would want to fall into sin and then you know there's a slippery slope sometimes in in some areas of life where the sin can take us deeper and deeper and deeper and actually further and further away from God chocolate cake is my favorite cake I don't know about you and um, the trouble is, every time I have a cup of tea, bear with me, I do enjoy my tea, I have to open the fridge to, to get the milk. And every time I open the fridge to get the milk, I get a waft of the chocolate cake. And this chocolate cake that's here for celebration tomorrow is very tempting. But every time I shut the door, it's not so bad because... I can't see it or smell it, so I'm not quite so tempted by it. Temptation crouches at our door. And if you open the door to it even a tiny bit, then we can fall into sin. You know, every time I open this door, different things could come to mind. You know, maybe I should just test that it tastes all right. Maybe I should make sure that it's good enough for my friends. You know, it, it's my friend's fault. Uh, I need to test it because of, of them. Uh, I need to check it's okay. And actually, temptation is like that, isn't it? It's very subtle at times. You know, it's the flesh, the world, and the devil tempt us 
to, to do things. And shutting the door is often the best form of defence. The Lord's Prayer says, you know, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Bible talks about resisting, about standing firm, uh, about, you know, not going down that path that leads to sin. You know, we need to, you know, as God's people recognise that that temptation isn't from God, that this is the world, the flesh, the devil trying to take us a different way. God is grieved by all sin. And as his people who want to live lives that please him, uh, he wants us to live life without sin. You know, we, we mess up absolutely all the time. But God wants us to, to not go down the slippery slope, but to, to shut the door and to keep sin away as much as possible. And that's why he's given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us to stay holy, uh, to, uh, to be holy, and, uh, and we need his power at work in us to help us. But actually within that too, there's you know, not entertaining the thoughts that can come when we're tempted. Those little things, often it starts with little things that we do. You know, the temptation to open the door and just have a little bit. And then, mmm, mmm, tastes really good. And then to go back for more and more. And maybe, you know, maybe no one's watching or no one will know or just a little bit won't hurt. And yet before long we can be really deeply into sin. Sin is crouching by the door. We need to walk with God and keep away from sin. You know, we can open the door a little bit and find that we have drifted away from God and find that we are on a path that takes us away from him. And that's not what God wants. So let's live as his people who love God and don't love sin. And let's walk closely with him, not in shame or guilt, but in newness of life that he wants us to have. So let's pray together. Father God, thank you that you love us so deeply that you sent Jesus to die for our sin. And Lord, would you forgive us for those times where we are tempted and we fall into sin and we do or say or think things that are not pleasing to you. Lord, would you cleanse us? Would you renew us? Would you fill us afresh with your spirit, Lord, that we would live as your people to please and to honour you and not to live for our own selfish uh, pleasure and desires. Lord, would you help us in this? Lord, we want to live closely with you, grow closer to you. Lord, would you draw us near and keep us away from evil? For yours is the power, the kingdom and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Or well, from the kitchen. It's goodbye for now. Goodbye. God bless.